Thank you, Arudi, for coming. This is data management in the hybrid multi-cloud era. I am Rakesh Jain. I work for IBM Research. And I'm also involved with uh, TOC uh, chair, as STOC chair with Soda Foundation. How many of you know about Soda Foundation? Not? OK. We'll go into it. And uh, so my co-presenters, uh, Reddy and uh, uh, Yuji Yazawa-san, um, they couldn't travel to this event. So I'll be taking you through this thing. So uh, first of all, yeah, um, we'll go into the Soda Foundation, what it is. It is actually a open source community under Linux Foundation and uh, deals with all the storage management related projects, open source projects. So that's the first part. And the second part, um, I will go into Kubernetes-based uh, data replication across multiple clouds or clusters. So those are the two main items we'll go into. So first of all, Soda Foundation, as I mentioned, it's uh, storage management, uh, uh, open source projects. And um, it actually uh, is fully open source. Uh, it's not like, uh, uh, you know, something is closed, something is open kind of thing. It's fully open source, uh, completely begged by the community. It's actually built from uh, from stretch. So it's not like some company has donated some project and then it is carrying over. So it takes a long time to actually build something like this. And um, uh, and we'll go into you know uh, what all is involved in this. Uh, so it's yeah, totally open and uh, the website is sodafoundation.io. So these are actually the members today uh, with Soda Foundation. There are different levels of uh, membership, but uh, as you see, it's uh, a global community all over the world and, uh, and growing. All right. Uh, so in short, uh, the Soda Foundation itself has some open source projects uh, which it built for uh, all related to storage. And then, on top of that, um, there are other open source projects uh, in, the, in the community which can become part of Soda Foundation, and those we call as um, uh, ecosystem projects. So these are some projects like YIG, uh, OpenEBS, uh, Cortex, um, all this, LinStore. All these projects are part of Soda Foundation as well as eco projects. As part of um, uh, this foundation and in collaboration with Linux Foundation Research, uh, we do uh, some technology trend or, or survey kind of thing every year. Um, this year's survey is about to come. Um, it's actually a long process to prepare the survey and work with the Linux Foundation Research to come up with uh, all the right questions. And, and, and uh, uh, they help us reach the right uh, uh, responders. So, so yeah. In short, we do you know all kinds of um, uh, surveys uh, related to storage. All right. Uh, so, in terms of um, you know what it is. So basically, we're trying to build a framework or, or set up a framework where everything related to storage, uh, all the way from, uh, it sits in the middle like a storage resource manager. So it sits in the middle between the compute and the storage, um, mostly in the control plane, sometimes in the data plane as well. So yeah, basically we do all kinds of uh, things you can think of, uh, whether it is protection, whether it is uh, monitoring, whether it is uh, provisioning and whatnot. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the overall framework. In terms of, um, as I mentioned, there are projects built within Soda Foundation. All these projects more or less use this kind of architecture 
um, which is, you can say, it's pretty standard. <laughs> so uh, at the bottom, you will have different storage systems. At the top, you will have different compute engines. Um, and then um, uh, the core here is controller. Uh, and then interfacing on the, on the southbound as well as northbound side, monitoring, governance, and, and whatnot. So that's you know, a standard architecture we try to follow in each project. Now, what are the projects um, we are working on currently? These are the current projects, all related to data management. And um, the first one is uh, Kahoo, uh, which is um, about uh, backup and recovery in cloud native environment, so basically on in Kubernetes clusters. So, so that's one. Uh, the second one is Strato. This is about moving the data across multi-cloud environments and mainly related to object store. So, So one thing I want to actually mention before I go into this. So the way SODA community and SODA projects work is based on uh, feedback from the end user advisory committee. Now what is it? Uh, so, so like every project has you know, technical oversight committee and uh, uh, um, advisory council like that, right? So what we have is end user advisory committee, which actually consists of current or potential end users. And they give us feedback that this is the problem area and uh, we need a solution in this space. Uh, or I'm having problem with vendor lock-in and whatnot, right? So I want some solution in the open source space. So this Strato project actually came uh, as part of the uh, major feedback from a very big uh, uh, end user member, and uh, they actually wanted to have this visibility as well as uh, ability to move data between these different object stores. So Strato is, is that kind of uh, project. Then we have Delphin, which is um, storage monitoring, and um, uh, this is you install it in, in a cloud native fashion, but it actually is able to monitor all your storage uh, uh, systems, uh, mostly you know, even if they are heterogeneous. So we know this is a problem when you're dealing with multiple different kinds of vendors, uh, that, that there's no standard interface. Um, there used to be, uh, I don't know if you guys still remember Simom, but um, not that useful yet, um, and there are new ones now you may have heard today. But again, um, we try to actually do as much as we can in the open source world with this different, different uh, vendors available. The fourth project, uh, which is very new, is uh, Crystal. Now, when we started Strato, uh, you know, Strato is about moving the data from with different object stores. We realized that the problem before moving is actually you know, finding what is where. <laughs> and Crystal is actually uh, a result of that. That it is actually a uh, platform where you can actually get the information about what kind of data you have laying around in different uh, places in different uh, cloud storage uh, uh, providers. So that's, um, uh, we'll talk about Kahoo and Crystal a little more uh, later on. And please feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions anytime. Um, so yeah, right away, uh, let's talk about uh, Kahoo, which is about protection. So this actually comes under um, what we call container data management. And um, again, this is a kind of standard looking architecture as we follow the same for all the projects. And uh, uh, in CDM, basically, we are just trying to make sure 
we use the right interfaces, for example, CSI for interacting with the storage, uh, and this is all in Kubernetes, right? And um, um, all kinds of different workloads. So that's, that's um, and most important is that it is heterogeneous. It supports heterogeneous uh, storage providers. Um, the GitHub link is there. You can go and see more details there. So in CDM, then this is uh, a project called Kahoo, which is all about um, uh, backing up your persistent volumes from Kubernetes into object store. So this is, um, uh, I think there are two or three open source projects in this world uh, which do more or less uh, similar things. There are some differences. Uh, and uh, the whole idea here is that, you know, uh, there is a couple of options when you have this um, persistent volume in Kubernetes where you can actually do a snapshot using CSI um, because CSI volumes have that feature. Or you can use something like uh, another open source tool called Restic. Uh, to do the similar thing. With snapshot, uh, with volume snapshot, you actually do it within the cluster. You cannot go outside the cluster, right? But with um, Restic, you can actually even go outside the cluster. And the, the, the intention here is that you actually do the backup in object store, and from there you can restore in another Kubernetes cluster if you want to. Or in the same Kubernetes cluster later on if you want to. So that's, that's the whole idea about um, Kahoo. This is um, actually, again, uh, the GitHub is there. Uh, you can try it yourself. Uh, it's um, pretty stable and uh, uh, in use in, in, in at least a couple of customers right now. OK, and uh, the next project is Crystal, as I just mentioned. Uh, this is all about uh, metadata management. And uh, so here again, we are dealing with uh, all the different kinds of storage providers. Um, we are going to start. With, uh, OK, so this is a very new project. Uh, as, as I mentioned, it came just after we developed Strato. So this is the very new project. It's still under discussions, uh, still under design phase. Uh, the current idea is basically, you know, we will start with uh, Object Store and uh, AWS. And um, the intention here is basically to get all the different uh, information about the content you have in those places. Um, and once we have this information, we can do all kinds of analytics on it, all kinds of search, searches on it, and um, even tagging so that you know uh, what your uh, data is and, and what you want to do with it. Um, what it brings us, like for example, you can do classification. You can actually know, you know what is the frequency of the usage of data, when it, was it created, when was it last accessed, um, if the data is sensitive or not. Um, sometimes you want to back it up, uh, you are required to back it up, but you're not backing it up or other way. So you can find all that information. Um, for, again, for compliance reasons as well. Um, if the permissions are too open, uh, that kind of thing also you can find. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that besides just the name of the file or type of the file, there's a lot of other information which is going to be gathered and uh, uh, is going to be available through a single um, interface so uh, from different cloud providers or on-prem. And then you will be able to see uh, what is lying where. Um, there is another thing like, you know, um, 
raw data, right? I mean, this is basically redundant, obsolete, or trivial data. So the data which exists in your environment, but it's of no use. So that kind of data uh, sitting there is just, uh, even for compliance reasons, you are not supposed to have, you, you don't have to store it. So, so that kind of information you don't have to keep and you can get rid of, right? So we will be able to provide this kind of information as well. All right, so yeah, I mean, this is, a, I guess I mentioned it's pretty, uh, you know, new project, just starting with, you know, collect, store, and search. And then, you know, uh, because we did some work in Strato, we'll be using that uh, in this project as well. All right, so that's about Soda. Any questions, comments? All right, so the next thing is um, multi-cloud data replication for Kubernetes. Um, you may have, okay, let's talk about first the, the different terminology here before we get into the details. So cloud native storage, just to level set, uh, what we are talking here is that storage built on top of containers. You know, who is using it is a different thing. It's containers who can use it, it's non-containers who can use it. But it is basically a software-defined storage system which is built using container ecosystem, container orchestration system and all that. So that's um, cloud native storage. Uh, I mentioned the term CSI a couple of times, and that is uh, basically it's a specification for containers to interface with the storage. Now that storage could be your storage system uh, of different kinds, right? So that's CSI. So CSI is a specification, so that's one. CNAs, on the other hand, is basically the storage system built using containers. And we want to actually use cross-cloud or cross-cross-cluster replication for CNS. Um, I have not seen any solutions, at least not in open source, which do this thing yet. So, you know, and, very simply, I'm trying to just, again, level set here. So CNS basically is uh, something which can just be code because, of course, it requires hardware, but it can run on any hardware available because it is software-defined solution. The way it works is that the, the solution, SDS solution, works in the container cluster, Kubernetes, and uh, it creates a storage pool from the drives available in each host. Now, so basically what it is doing is that it's combining the storage from the host, the server, and virtualization in one platform, basically, and then it's giving you a CNS. If you look at this picture on the right, it's basically a pod is accessing a persistent volume, PV1, through PVC1, which is persistent volume claim, <coughs> on node one, right? So the CNS, the way it works is that it has to have some redundancy, right? So if node one goes down or if pod one relocates to another node, you know, whatever happens, what it does basically is that for PV1, it will have a replica on other nodes. Usually they go with at least two replicas. So, so that, you know, whenever the pod one moves to node two or node three, or even on node four where there is no replica, uh, it will have something uh, to access the data it deals with. So that's the basic structure of uh, uh, at very high level, because you know different CNS providers um, have some variations there, but at high level, this is what happens. Uh, 
In terms of the current open source CNS solutions, there is like OpenEBS, Longhorn, Portworx. Portworx is not open. And then uh, Red Hat uh, Open Data Foundation. I'm giving you example here in all my slides with OpenShift, but it's applicable to Kubernetes as well. Now, so this is just the CNS. Now, if you want to do protection, you basically use some external things like Kahoo or, or VMware Valero, um, which would do the, the, the snapshot and backup kind of thing, which we talked before. So this is uh, high level how CNS works. Now, what we want to do, basically. So, as I mentioned, we want to actually extend this CNS solution to go cross cloud or cross cluster. And if you look at this picture on the top, uh, there are two Kubernetes clusters, one in cloud one, another is cloud two. It could be in two different regions within the same cloud as well. Um, and what we want to do is that if we have a CNS solution available in cloud one, we want to be able to replicate the data to cloud two as well, so that we can bring up our application. Maybe we use it as a, as a standby, or you know, depends on your CNS provider, uh, it can be uh, active active as well. Now, what is the problem? Why it doesn't actually exist today? The problem is that this Kubernetes pod networks are private. And uh, you cannot actually, like for example, if pod one wants to talk to pod four, you cannot actually do it directly. Now, you, the way you can do it is through a service, like service two. From pod one, you can go to service two, and then you go to that load balancer, and then you don't know where it will land. It can land on four, five, or six, right? So that's not the approach that can work uh, when you want pod to pod direct connectivity. So that's the solution, I mean, the problem we're trying to solve, um, that because the network is private and, and this goes through this service framework, um, we cannot easily achieve this. So we want to get to this bottom picture where every pod is able to go to every other pod in the other cluster, and vice versa. Now, we don't want vice versa always, but with this solution, that will be possible. Okay, so, so, uh, so it's not entirely true that there's no such solution exists today. I mean, people have been trying for it um, and have put forward some solutions. So first is, uh, there are two categories in which the solutions lie. One is pod to service connectivity, which I just mentioned, that doesn't work for us. And all these service meshes like Steo, Linkerd, um, MCS in Go, they all actually uh, fall in this category. They do part to service across cluster. Um, they do have good thing about discovering the service because of course DNS is also local, right? DNS cannot work across. So, so they do have that kind of uh, features, but they don't address our current problem. Then there are some solutions which actually provide part to part connectivity. Um, but they have major drawbacks, and uh, one such solution is about uh, flat network. Mm -hmm. You flatten the network of pod and your nodes, so your pods are sitting on the same network as the node is, and um, they are in the same address space, and it has its own problems, which, uh, so most of the cloud providers actually provide this uh, feature. Uh, for example, Amazon has it, uh, as well as Azure and Google, um, but uh, they have a lot of problems uh, in terms of I mean, how you want to use it, basically, right? So I, I don't think I will go into this long list. Um, at the high level, um, basically, there is a security exposure, and then there is a dependency on CNI. Like CSI, there is CNI, which is container network interface. and. Uh, all these different cloud providers have their own CNI implementation, and that's why that's how they are able to do this flat network. Are they compatible with each other? Maybe, maybe not. Mostly not. 
So in that case also our solution won't work or what we want to achieve won't work. Um, and then yeah, they have a lot of requirements in terms of uh, uh, the IP address range uh, should be same or, uh, or should be different for the different uh, cloud providers. That's another, another problem. Um, there is another set of uh, solutions put forward which are basically IPsec tunneling. So what is happening is that in your pod network, you will have one gateway pod sitting which would work as a gateway uh, to, uh, to a tunnel, through a tunnel to another cluster. And that one um, has its own limitations, basically. Uh, and the biggest one is that it requires a third cluster to be available for you to make it work. Okay, now, what we want here is that a very simple solution which actually addresses our storage area. Because if you look at you know, most of the applications, the application, all other components do not actually need to go to other cluster either way. It's the storage which needs to go, and if storage is replicated, is in sync, then your application is fine because everything else is stateless. So um, we don't actually want to expose the whole cluster to another cluster as well, right? Reduce the security risk. But typically, yeah, so this is what we want. And the way we solve it is uh, uh, what we call as an overlay network. So this overlay network is built on top of existing network um, of your OCP or Kubernetes. Where available, right? So if it is available in uh, Cloud One, so that's what for internal communication. Within this overlay network, it uses the Cloud One network. On Cloud Two, it uses Cloud Two network. In between, uh, we have this solution, which will actually go through um, a service mechanism again, but to a specific part. So we'll get into details. But basically, yeah. So it's a overlay network and some intelligent routing and proxy. Um, parts um, using which we build this network. And this network is such that it uses actually Kubernetes constructs. So we don't need DNS for this guy. And uh, very minimal routing changes which are local within the pod. Okay, so <laughs> the way it works is because we're creating a new overlay network, we actually decide an IP address range for both the clouds or clusters for just our piece. Um, and then we specify some routing rules such that if the, if the packet is supposed to go to a different pod within the cluster or outside the cluster, we route it accordingly. That's the key, uh, what I'm trying to say on this page. Um, and another important thing is that the IP address we generate, the IP address we generate for each pod is such that, as I mentioned, we don't need DNS, um, because otherwise we had to, you know, create our own DNS within each cluster. But you, how do you go across cluster then? So what we do is that our app IP, we call it, the app IP is such that it, um, it can resolve into the name of the pod. Okay, so that's one thing. From IP, you can get to the pod. From pod name, you can get to the IP. And that is based on the host name of the pod. Um, so that's the critical piece. And if that, that's what we have done. So with that, we can actually go back and forth between pod and IP. When we have to route the traffic within the network of the local cluster, we find out the <coughs> name of the pod where it is supposed to go, and then we use the underlying network. So we don't do our, our own network, basically, in that case. 
I will try to get into the more, more details in the next slide. So if you look at this, there are two clusters, and just two parts here in the first cluster, and just two in the second cluster. In the first part here, uh, top left, it has got an app IP of uh, 10.1.0.0. Now this is not the pod IP, right? The pod itself has some other IP address like 192.168, whatever. Here, what we are doing is that we have given it this, uh, all these pods, we have given the corresponding IP address. If you look at the top layer, they've got IP address of 10.1. This, the bottom layer, they've got IP address of 10.2. If the destination from, from top left, uh, let's say it is going to the, 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 the top right one, 10.1.0.0 to 10.1.0.1. Because it is going to 10.1, it knows that it is for local network. If it is for local network, it will actually route it to uh, egress local proxy. So that, that proxy sidecar has these four different proxy servers, two for ingress, two for egress. Two for ingress is one local, one remote, and same with egress, one local, one remote. So the, if it is for local, it will go to egress local. Egress local knows that, hey, this is my, I, I'm, I, I'm supposed to actually send it to my local cluster, and uh, all I have to do is find out its uh, host name, because what I'm given is 10101, right? 10101, nobody knows what it is. But I can reverse it into the host name. Once I know the host name, I can just route it to the host name and then route it only to the ingress local port of the destination. From there, ingress local knows that, okay, I got something for my own port and I will actually forward it to the <coughs> listening port of the application, in this case, which is 5,000. So this is how the local works. And the way the remote one works is that, let's say if it is going from 10.1.0.0 to 10.2.0.1, the bottom right. So from there, it will go to the remote um, listener service from egress remote because the routing rules tell that, okay, it is for 10.2.0.0. 10.2 is another cloud, so it will go to the Egress remote, egress remote knows that anything coming to me has to go to this remote listener service of the destination. It goes to remote listener service of the des destination. Now, if you look at those green arrows, it can land on pod one of cloud two or pod two of cloud two. Our destination is pod two. Suppose it lands on pod one of cloud two, it will land on ingress remote port that's where we are listening. That guy determines that anything coming to me, it will do exactly the same thing which egress local did. Anything coming to me with 10.2 address, all I have to do is find out the um, host name of the pod in my cluster and route it through underlying network to that host. So that's how, even though you're using the service, which is remote listener service here, and the root of the problem is that it can land on any pod, but with this solution, we can actually land it to the right pod um, through our proxy server. So that's the overall um, mechanism of getting every pod to be able to talk to every other pod or any other pod in the remote cluster. Is there a question? Yeah. Yes. So in this model right here, when you write to one of the pods and you go replicate to the other pods, every write, let's, let's say your pods are in a different region in the same cloud or you're going to another cloud, every single write operation is going to generate an egress or a cross-region replication cost because you're, every single time, do you have any functionality planned to mitigate that, to duplicate it, compress it, oh. something like that? Yeah, yeah. No, it's a good question. So I think the question is, just to repeat it, is that um, every uh, write happening in pod one will cause traffic, basically, 
to another pod, wherever it is supposed to go. So what I'm talking here right now is a networking solution. We have not yet applied to the storage, right? So this is just networking so that you know that. No, I have more transit costs, which is networking. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if, the net, if the packet is supposed to go there, all we are doing is that giving it a route to go. Whether packet is supposed to go there, it's the origin's decision, right? So, okay. So this is, yeah, again, this is a networking solution, and then we apply it to the storage. Yeah, go ahead. So that can be very inefficient. Is there any, do you have any optimizations to kind of optimize that workflow? Okay, so the question is, it can be very inefficient, but can you describe mm -hmm. why it will be inefficient? Because egress and egress on, on the cloud, Azure, Amazon, I might not oh. wanna, I wanted to make sure that I get the best of it. So do you have any things in mind that can make it more efficient to use, like to make sure that communication is minimized while still getting the, the benefits of having the Google Cloud solution? Um, okay, uh, I think, yeah, that's more of a broader question. Like, um, if I twist your question, basically you're saying that why do you need multi-cloud solution? Is it? Okay. So that might be, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Again. Uh, no. Actually, I haven't uh, come across that solution yet. That if you want to minimize um, the the communication, um, I actually will give you an example where it is uh, where we have used it um, very efficiently. Um, maybe in a slide or two later. So, okay, I think, yeah, yeah this is actually uh, clear. I thought it will take, it's not easy to describe this, the solution, but um, I guess you get the idea. Uh, and this is the flow of it, you know, if it is local, uh, it will go to egress local proxy, and then it will find the fully qualified domain name of the pod, and then using the underlying network, it will go to the ingress local proxy, and then it will go to the destination. If it is remote, it will go the same way to ingress remote proxy, though, and from there, it will follow the same uh, network mechanism. Now, how do we apply this? So, the container networking uh, storage, right? They do this replication today. If you look at just the left side, between the parts within the cluster. They may be on different nodes, right? What they want to do actually is also replicate the data to the parts in the other cloud so that the replicated data is available on the other side as well. So that is uh, entirely doable now. They, won't need this many connections because they just do, you know, one part to one part or one part to two parts, right? Um, besides that, I think the, the, the networking solution applies on this container native storage systems. Um, every provider has little bit of differences how they do it. If I had to do it like very naively, I will just do our sync <laughs> from one part to another, uh, as simple as that. The idea here is that you know you get the data there. Now, do you really need that? In, uh, in terms of optimization, uh, I will leave it on the container native storage providers that how they want to minimize the cost uh, or how they want to do the replication. Um, or when we implement this thing through our projects, then of course, yeah, we'll think about that. But do you actually need this kind of replication all the time? Um, at the storage level. The reason I said that is because um, there are some solutions uh, which sit above this storage. And especially if you think about the databases, like uh, in this case, it is Cassandra. So Cassandra actually does this replication very well at its level. 
you don't actually need any storage level replication for that. The way it works is that um, in case of Cassandra, it actually needs every pod to be able to connect to every other pod uh, in the Cassandra cluster. And uh, if you want to extend it, um, if you want to extend it to another cluster, then you do need one pod in, in cloud one to be able to connect to all the six pods in cloud two. Um, now, Cassandra does it very efficiently. Um, so again, it all depends on your solution, how um, it is designed to do replication. Um, this is actually uh, building one Cassandra cluster across two clouds, and it is two ways. So it is active, active in both sides. And uh, you can have workload either way, and it will actually replicate the data accordingly. So, so if you do the replication at this application level or database level, you don't need actually storage level replication. Um, but again, there are cases where you do need that as well. So anyway, um, this is what I wanted to share with you guys that uh, um, what we are working on in terms of enabling cross cluster or cross cloud uh, replication on Kubernetes. And uh, that's it. Any questions? No? All right. Thank you all. <laughs>